serve a great and mighty God, whose awesome power has allowed us to be present once again. Welcome to the sanctuary of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church, the church living out God's commandment to love through a commitment to serve. This is the third Sunday in January, January 16, 2022. And on this weekend, we celebrate the birth and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So we ask that you will serve, find someone to serve this weekend, find someone whose life you can bless. Please now join us for our morning call to worship. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your, your righteousness is like a strong mountain. Your justice like a great deep. You say, both oh man and beast, O oh Lord. How priceless is your love, O oh God. Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They, they feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them the drink from the river of your delight. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Continue your love and kindness to those who know you, and your faith to those who are the true of heart. We come to praise the holy, undivided, triune God, who was in the beginning, is now, and will forever be God. Hallelujah and amen. Now join us in worship as the St. James Praise Team takes us high. I love to pray.
We know that we are in troubled times. We know that people are scattered and confused about the pandemic. But we know that we are safe in your arms. We know that you already have this under control. So we don't have to worry and scramble about what we're going to do or how we're going to do it. Because you told us you'd never leave us nor forsake us. So we say thank you. Thank you for going into the hospitals and touching our loved ones. Thank you for going into the prisons and touching our loved ones. Thank you for going into the drug house and bringing our loved ones out. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for cleansing the earth with the snow today. Thank you for cleansing our hearts and our minds. Lord, there's so much we have to be thankful for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We thank you for those of us that have had birthdays. And we've seen another year. Yeah. We thank you for bringing us into this new year. Yeah. We're grateful. Thank you for your grace and mercy that follows us in all the days of our lives. We can't thank you enough. If we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't yes, thank yes, you enough yes, for what yes, you have done. Yes. So Father God, we come together today to worship your name, to praise your name, and to thank you for keeping us. You said in your word, if two or more come together, you are in agreement. So we thank you that you have blessed this house. We thank you that you have continued to raise us up. We thank you that our praise continually rise. We thank you for touching us, touching our minds, our hearts, our spirits. Yes, Lord. Lord, we thank you for keeping us in our right mind. There are so many people that have lost their mind. They're confused. They're tired. They don't know which way to go. But we thank you that you kept us in our right mind. That you kept us standing tall. Because we know that this is where we need to be. Under your wing, in your word. We say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us enough not to give up on us. We know that we have things to do. We know that we have to come together as one. The unity is not just in the church, but it's all the churches coming together. It doesn't matter the denomination. Because we're under you, Father God. One God. And we say thank you for loving us. Thank you for continuing having your hand on our pastor as he brings the word every Sunday, every Wednesday every day of his life. He's preaching to somebody. He's walking as they see him. He's standing upright in your word. Yeah. And we say thank you for covering him. Thank you for giving him the voice to be heard as he feeds the flock that you put him in charge of. Thank you for his prayers. Thank you for his birthday coming up. Thank you for the love that you pour into him and he pours into us. So we say thank you. thank you. Now, Father God, as we come together to worship your name, to sing praises to your name, we'll never forget that everything that we have and everything that we do, we only have it because of you. And we're ever grateful because of that. And we pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our scripture today comes from the book of Hosea, the sixth chapter, verses one through nine. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn and he will heal us. He has struck down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will rise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. He's, his appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that waters the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that comes away early. Therefore, I have hemmed them by the, by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. 
For I, for I desire your steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But in Adam they transgressed the covenant. There they, there they dealt, dealt faithfully, faithful list with me. Right. Gilead is a city of evildoers trapped with blood. As robbers lie in wait for someone, so the priests are bad together. They murder, they murder on the road of Shem. They commit a monstrous crime. Word of God for all of the people of God. Amen. Amen. Miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now.
when we look at what's happening in our personal lives, in, in the streets of Memphis, and, and what may be going on in our workplaces, we have to walk through the halls and say, well, you never lost a battle, God. We, we walk into a hospital, you never lost a battle. We walk into a rehab, you never lost a battle. When we walk into the church, God, you never lost a battle. When we walk into our homes and things may be in disarray, we, we have to say, God, I, I know what it looks like, but you never, never lost a battle. And I know you never will. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let us, let us pray. God, we thank you. Yes, yes. For being that God that's never lost a man. Yes. That God who can do all things yes. but fail. Yes. God, we are so grateful. Now, God, this word that's going to go forth it is our humble request that this touch someone's life. God, we realize there are people that are hurting. There are people, God, that need to hear a word from you. So move me out of the way. I don't need to be seen, and you need to be heard. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. This uh, word of God comes today from the Gospel of John in the second chapter. And I'll begin at the first verse. Gospel of John, the second chapter. And I'll begin at the first verse. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it come from, though the servants who had drawn it, drawn the water knew, the servant called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and the inferior wine after the guests get drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. For a theme for the next few minutes, your time has come. All right, all right. Your time your has time. come. All right, yeah. Uh, most of you know I preached my first sermon when I was 12, but many of you have not heard the backstory. Uh, I was chair of Youth Day that year. I was 12 years old, and as in many cases, I was in charge of, I was the, the young person that they came to to do just about everything, because they knew my grandmother and my mother were going to make me do it, so that's how I ended up being the one that had to be in place. And, we were at a retirement banquet for uh, our neighbor across the street, also a member of my home church, and my pastor came to me and said that our guest speaker was not going to be able to make it. And I was a little upset. I said, well, what are we going to do, Pastor? What are we going to do? And he just stood there for a second and looked at me, and, and then he said, oh, I have someone in mind. And, and I'm looking around like, okay, he says, are they here? Who is it? He said, oh, you can handle it. And of course, my jaw dropped. I looked at Larry Thomas and said, um, are you sure about that? And he said, oh yes, you can do fine. Now mind you, this was a Thursday evening and youth day was that Sunday coming. And so I went home and started writing. My, I talked to my mother, because my mother wasn't gonna say anything against the pastor or disagree with him. So she told me, you better get to work. So I got there and although uh, I felt like it was not my hour, so to speak. It was indeed my time to stand before God's people. My time had come. Uh, I was in no hurry to step into the pulpit. Let me say that again. I was in no hurry at all to step into the pulpit. But it became apparent that my time had come. I, I didn't invite it. And as a matter of fact, I preferred to have watched from the sidelines, but there were others around me who saw differently. 
the Gospel of John tells us another story similar to that. And uh, the Gospel of John, unlike the other Gospels, focuses on Jesus being the direct pathway to eternal life. Jesus speaks of his relationship to the Father in very personal terms. And the groundwork is being laid for who Jesus is and how Jesus operates in our world at large and in our personal lives. And this narrative is the first of many that demonstrates to us who Jesus is. Jesus is attending the wedding of his mother Mary's cousin. This is a family event and, and, and reception, his family wedding and reception. Jesus was there, not as Jesus the Savior, but Jesus the dutiful son accompanying his mother to a wedding reception. Jesus was not trying to be seen, not trying to be heard. He was just there trying to be a part of the festivities. Jesus was not interested in being addressed or even seen as the Son of God. He was there because it was a family event and he was a part of the family. Similar to us as pastors when we just want to go somewhere and not be called pastor, not be called reverend, not be called doctor, just sit down and enjoy ourselves and not be called on to pray or to lay hands on somebody or to do all that extra stuff. We just want to sit back and have some ribs and some potato salad and mac and cheese and enjoy being in company of family. Now, uh, they had been at this wedding reception for three days because most wedding receptions, most wedding receptions lasted for a week. Women uh, who were virgins got married on Wednesdays and the wedding reception could last as long as seven days. So we are three days into this reception and they have a major problem. They have run out of wine. Now to understand the severity of this problem, we've really got to understand one basic element of Israelite culture, ancient Israelite culture. Hospitality, especially welcoming strangers, is basic to their life. It would be considered insulting for the family to run out of wine during a party like this. It, to take it a step further, it was regarded as a sin to be inhospitable and unwelcoming to people who are guests. If you don't believe me, look at Deuteronomy 10 and they'll tell you all about it. This was not a small problem because... Uh, and it had to be dealt with before it became a major crisis. Now, many, excuse me, Mary hears what is happening, and knowing this could be a disaster, she goes to someone that she knows that can handle or believe can handle the situation. She goes to Jesus, and the reason is up for debate. There are some that there's some evidence of Mary knowing Jesus could do this based on what she saw the toddler Jesus do. That's that, that there's, there's some, some gospels that were unpublished in the Bible that were written that tell a story about Jesus accidentally killing a small bird as a toddler and he brings the bird back to life. So maybe Mary saw that or maybe Mary was just sure that Jesus could do it based upon the fact that she knew he was the son of God and the son of God had to have some kind of power. The, the, he could not be the son of God and have no power. What would be the point? of Jesus being on earth and having no power. So she tells, she, she goes to speak to Jesus and oddly enough, she speaks to Jesus not as the savior, but as her son. Uh, those of you who have mothers and, and fathers who are, um, shall we say, will volunteer you what to do, you understand what I mean. They, they'll come to you and not as anyone in any position, but as their child. They'll say, you need to do this. This is what Mary does. She goes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now, Jesus wants to know, what does this have to do with us? Or in more common terms, Jesus said, this is not our business. We, I don't need to be a part of that. I'm just here to celebrate like everyone else. I just want to sit back and enjoy what's happening, enjoy the festivities. I'm not trying to be Jesus Christ the Savior. I'm just trying to be plain old Jesus. Not that ever Jesus could ever be plain, but I just want to be plain old Jesus. I just want to sit back in the cut and not be bothered. Uh, Jesus wants to, Jesus looks at this situation and he's not interested in doing the miraculous or something spectacular. Uh, Jesus rebuffing his mother comes from a place of, of trying to remain in God's kairos or God's moment in time. Jesus says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. And when he's talking about his hour, he's talking about his hour to be glorified. 
Messiah. He's talking about his hour that so that folk will show enough know that he's the Messiah. He's talking about that hour, and Jesus has a feeling in his inside of him that says that if he does this, then that will uh, that will show enough tell who he is. But what ends up happening is that this is the most ironic part, and this tells you how mothers and sons relate. The most ironic part of this narrative is no matter what Jesus says, Mary tells the servants, you obey Jesus. She says, do what he tells you to do. This implies that he's about to do something. She doesn't know what he's going to do, but she tells the servants, whatever he does, you do it. Whatever Jesus says, that's what you are to do. So, so, so we, uh, when we look at this text, Jesus is trying to tell his mother, this is not my hour, meaning my season. This is not my season to be glorified. This is not my season to show who I am. This is not my season. You see, all of us have a season where God does something extra special with us. We, you might be a musician and your, your season might be when you're on the top 100 or you, you're all playing all over the world. That's your season. You might be an educator who becomes teacher of the year and then you go on to be the national teacher of the year and you're teaching seminars and workshops about how to construct a, a, a solid uh, a lesson plan. That, that's your season. We as, as pastors have seasons of glory, if you want to call it that, where our church is on top. We are on top. Everywhere we go, we're preaching and singing and doing such things. That, that's what Jesus is referring to, his season to be glorified. Jesus said, it's not my season. But Mary disregards all of that and says to the servants, do what he tells you. Mary's words say to her son, this may not be your season, but it's your time. Now the question is, what exactly is Mary implying? This may not be your season, but it's your time. Uh, number one, there is a need. When, when Mary goes to Jesus, she said there is no wine. The party's about to shut down because they don't have any libation. The, the party is going to end because the people don't have anything. They don't have anything to drink. They weren't going to drink water. This was a wedding party. They, they weren't going to drink water. They weren't going to have grapefruit juice. They, they didn't want apple juice. They weren't interested in Cokes. Not that they had Cokes back then, but they wanted some wine. They wanted to enjoy themselves. And for people that get stuck on that whole issue about wine, wine then is not like we know it now. It's, we're not talking about Mad Dog 2020. We're not talking about Stella Rosa. The wine that they drank during that time was a very low alcohol content. So don't get caught on the wine, but understand what was going on in the story. There was a need. Mary didn't want her family to be embarrassed. Mary didn't want her family to look inhospitable. Her Mary didn't want the family to look as though something was wrong or they had planned poorly. They, they, there was a need to fulfill and, 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 and Jesus was really the only one that could fix it. Yes. Amen. Yes. There's a need that needs to be fulfilled. And Jesus is the only one that can do anything about it. Yeah, right. uh, and we have to remember that those of us who work in ministry, those of us who, who maybe have, have, even have secular jobs, there's a need where you are that only you can fill. Amen. There's a need where you are that only you can, 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 can fill it, you can fix it. There's a need where you work, where you live, that only you, where you, only you can step in and be the person that can remedy the situation. If if, if you want to and look at, at a, a real life, a closer to, to our era example, the first person I thought about was Stacey Abrams. After she lost the election in the state of Georgia, she realized that it was not her season or her hour, but she also realized it was her time to do something. So Sister Abrams stepped up and got people registered to vote. It took her two years to do it, but she got so many, so many of us registered to vote, so many people registered to vote until they flipped Georgia from being a red state to being a blue state. We had They had their first Jewish senator and their first African-American senator. She's a woman that stepped up. She, but it was not her, her hour necessarily, but it was her time. Some of us are like that too. We, 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 
we keep saying that this is not my season. Oh, but it's your time to do something. Yes. There is a need out there for something that you've got to meet. God has, is about to work with you to do something out there in this world. There's a need. And not only was there a need, but Jesus had the power to fulfill the need. Uh, Jesus had something in him that no one else had. Uh, Jesus had the power of God on the inside of him. Jesus was not like any other rabbi or any other preacher or any other prophet. Jesus was indeed the son of God. Now, nobody knew it but Mary uh, for sure. And the disciples suspected it based on what he had said to them and how he had taught them. But then Mary was the only one that really knew it. But Jesus had the power on the inside to do something. And when Jesus has the power, he recognizes that it is his time to step up. It is his time to do something about what is wrong. It's his time to fix what has been broken. And many of us are, have something inside of us, all of us, if we say we belong to God, if we say we got some Holy Ghost on the inside, if we, we say we've been baptized in the mighty burning fire, if we say God has poured out an anointing on us, then we have something on the inside of us. We have the power to address the need. Then we have the power to speak to the mountain and the mountain move. We have the power to walk into City Hall and speak to the mayor and the mayor actually do something and for a change. We have the power to go to the governor's mansion and walk into Bill Lee's office and just pray. We ain't got to do nothing else. We can just lay hands on the man's desk and pray. And, and we can leave out and watch God work. We've got to realize we've got some power on the inside of us. We need to stop walking around afraid like we have no power. God put power in you that, 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 that only the Holy Ghost can work. God put something in you that's not in anybody else. It, it bothers me when saints walk around afraid. I don't know what kind of Jesus you serve, but you can't tell me you're afraid of everything and, and, and you serve a God that's all got all power. You serve a God that's never lost a battle, but you're afraid. God, God said, no, 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 you got to trust me. If you can't trust anyone else, you got to trust me. You got to believe me. There is power inside of you, power to change someone's life. I've got a church full of educators, and you all have the power to change some young man, some young woman's life just by pulling them aside, letting them know that they can do what everybody else is telling them they can't do. They may have parents telling them they can't. They may have their peers that tell them they can't. They may have an administrator in the school that you work in that says they can't. But it's in your power to tell them, yes, you can. And we're going to find a way for you to make it happen. You have the power. You may come in the church and, and you may be their mother or that father. You may not have any physical children, but everybody rallies around you because you've got some love inside of you. People just walk past you and know their love. People can walk up to you and you just hug them and they know that there's something there. You've got power to change a situation in someone's life. You have that power and now is your time to do something with it. Finally, if we look at this text, and, and the very last line of this text is so important to me. The very last line of this text uh, is an editorial comment from the author of the narrative. It says this, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Uh, so before I, when I, as I close out, I just want to remind you that people need a glimpse of glory. Yes. Uh, people may not, they may not need to see the full effect. Mm -hmm. At this point, it wasn't time for Jesus to show himself in all of his glory. Yeah. It wasn't the time for Jesus to show himself in all of his power. But it was time for them to see a glimpse of glory. To see just enough glory so they could believe. See, the disciples heard about Jesus from John the Baptist. The, the disciples knew about Jesus when, because Jesus and John the Baptist had had a conversation and they were after all, after all cousins and so the disciples knew of Jesus now you can know of Jesus but not know Jesus you can hear about Jesus but not actually be acquainted with who Jesus is everyone that I know of that's been saved has gotten a, a they became saved because they heard about Jesus but they stayed saved because they saw a glimpse of glory 
People need to see a glimpse of glory. The disciples, Jesus' newly called disciples, need to see a glimpse of glory. It was no accident that the disciples were at the wedding. One, the, 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 the disciple Nathaniel, he had relatives in this city, so he might have gone for a family reunion. The rest of the disciples were just tagging along because Jesus was there. But it was no accident that they were at this wedding reception. They needed to see a glimpse of glory. They needed to see that Jesus could do that which they were told he could do. They, they needed to see that Jesus had some power that they had never seen before. Jesus turning the water into wine. It wasn't about just making wine so folk could get drunk, but it was about seeing a glimpse of glory on earth. Now we need to see a glimpse of glory as well. For those of you who are fearful of COVID, we need to see a glimpse of glory. For those of you who may be nervous about going back into the world, we can't stay fearful and cloistered in our houses, but we do need to see a glimpse of glory. We do need to see something happen and somebody out there, one of you, might have something in you that, that will allow somebody to see a glimpse of the kingdom, that will allow somebody to see a glimpse of glory. You might be that one that can pray and, and see somebody get up off their sick bed. You, you might be the one that can speak and demons flee. You might be the one that can sing and lift someone's heart. You might be the one that, that can preach and, and somebody's mind will change you. You might be the one that can just, just go and shake someone's hand and they feel some power in that head shake. People need to see a glimpse of glory. We are tired as people right now of COVID-19, 20, 21, and 22. We're tired of that. We need to see a glimpse of glory. There are people who have relatives dying. We need to see a glimpse of glory. There are churches that are wondering if they're going to be able to stay open. We need to see a glimpse of glory. There are neighborhoods wondering if they're going to survive. We need to see a glimpse of glory. There are people wondering if they're going to have a job in the morning. They need to see a glimpse of glory. There are people who are wondering how they're going to make it from day to day. They need to see a glimpse of glory. There are people wondering if we have to be able to pass laws that actually make sense. We need to see a glimpse of glory. Power is to hook into 
Jesus Christ. So I offer Jesus to someone today. You, you may be wondering why things aren't working the way you need them to work. And maybe because you're disconnected from the Savior. But today, if you pray this prayer with me, you'll be connected to Jesus. Just pray this prayer. Dear Lord, I am a sinner and I need your grace. I want to be connected to the source of power. I, I've seen now that my time has come. Uh, Jesus, I believe you were born in this world to, to teach me how to live. And I believe you want the, the, the word, the streets of this world to show me how to love and care and to show justice among your people. I believe that you went to the cross to shed blood to cover my millions of sins. And most of all, I believe you rose on that third day morning with power in your hand to, to demonstrate that I am an overcomer. And I can do all things through you if I just believe you. I thank God. Thank you for salvation. And thank you for what you have done in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then you are saved. Amen. There's no tricks. It, it, it's nothing else you have to do. You don't have to give anybody any money. You ain't got to turn the cartwheels, roll on the pews. But that's it. If you have prayed that prayer with me, you are indeed saved. And we would ask that you will put your name and contact information into our direct message. Or you can email us at stjamesmemphis at gmail.com. That is stjamesmemphis at gmail.com. We will be glad to pray with you. We want to be a part of your life. We want to be that family. You may feel like you have no family, but we want to be that family that you believe you need in order to make it in this world. So we are grateful that you have blessed us, you have kept us, you have, you have, we are thankful that you have been a part, you're a part now of our church family. And God especially is grateful and we're so thankful that you are a part of us and we know that God can and will bless you yeah. in due season. Amen.